afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening to those of you that are other, in other parts of the world that are does not the United States. As I said before, my name is Maddie Frank, and I am the youth track leader for here at the Type Conference. And real quick, before I start going off on my presentation, I'd just like to say thank you all for joining us here today, especially on the youth track, because I know myself and my teammates that I've been working on to put on this fabulous conference are really excited to share all the wonderful speakers and expertise that we've gathered today with you. So thank you again for spending your time here with us today. So my presentation, Triangulating Your Path, How Simple Shape Helped Me Find a Way, My Way, is inspired by a good friend of mine, and his name is Jim. And Jim is a really interesting character. And if there's something you have to know about Jim for this whole entire presentation to make sense, is that he's actually a retired roadie. So for 20 years, Jim was a drum or guitar tech for some of, whoops, it is, I just got rid of my screen. But anyways, Jim was a guitar tech for some of the most influential musicians of our time including Sonic Youth, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, and even David Bowie. Like, Jim's a really cool guy, and you can imagine some of these stories that he tells. And it's really great to get into some good, deep conversation with Jim. It was during one of these conversations that Jim asked me, he said, Maddie, you know, you're graduating from college in a couple of months. What do you plan on doing? And I answered Jim, I said, I honestly don't really know. I love additive manufacturing, but there's so many different paths I could take with it. I could go to marketing or I could go to applications engineering. I just really don't know what I want to do, Jim. And he thought for a moment and he decided to share with me a philosophy that helped guide him throughout him and his fellow roadie friends, career track, okay? You see, to be a roadie, you have to think you had, you have to have some sort of guiding philosophy because it's a career track that doesn't have a lot of job security, nor is it a career track that's super easy to get into. It's very, very competitive. So in order to be able to go and pursue his career and work for some of the biggest names in music, him and his roadie friends had this idea. They revolved around the triangle. A triangle has three points, and to each point, Jim gave a word of wisdom, experience, network, and money. Now, the statement goes that for every opportunity that you take, it should meet at least two of the three points of the triangle. For example, if I decide to pursue an opportunity and it, it gives me experience and money, that's two to three points of the triangle. Experience being a new skill that I gain and money being, you know, money for my life to make sure that I'm being paid and I can support myself and my family. Whereas another opportunity, for example, should give you experience and an expanded network. Network being, am I working with someone new that I've always admired? Am I meeting someone that will be able to set me up for my next job after this tour with this musician is done, right? Who am I going to meet? And so when I heard this, I was like, wow, Jim, that's like a really good way to focus intentions. Like I'm gonna have to start doing this for my own personal life. But he said to me, Maddie, the triangle is not foolproof because the triangle can both lead to success or maybe not. But there's a trick to making the triangle work every single time. And to illustrate this trick, I'm gonna use a few of my personal experiences to share with you. So for those of you that don't know, I 3D printed an award-winning cello. This cello was printed on a Fortis 400 out of expired Ultim 9085. Every single part was printed in a full six hours or six full days of printing, I think was the total time. And it came out really well. It looks like this beautiful cello. I'm a cellist. I was able to combine my passions. And it actually took first place in the technical competition at AMUG Advanced Finishing in 2019. This cello, the results of it were amazing. I gained a lot of recognition in the additive manufacturing industry and beyond. 
I was suddenly introduced to people that were musicians and librarians and artists, and I got to expand my network and learn from them. I also got job opportunities from the cello as well and different from people seeing this and being impressed. And I also learned a lot of new skills because when I went into building this cello, of a 3D printing a cello that is, I did not know how to make a cello. I had the base skills, but I learned how a cello was made and learned how cellos are constructed. Okay. So by all points of this triangle philosophy, I hit two of the three points that would be considered a success. I gained experience and I expanded my network through the new people that I made or met. But the cello definitely did not make me money. The cello was very expensive to make with all the bondo. I mean, there's two gallons of bondo covering the entire thing, right? Like it's insane. It was very expensive, but that's okay. I hit two of the other three points of the triangle and it was successful. The triangle worked. Let's explore something else. My electrical engineering degree that I recently graduated with in December. I obtained a degree in a very high paying field. I expanded my professional network in the electrical engineering world through my volunteer work with a professional organization called IEEE. And I learned advanced electrical engineering skills that would help me on the job if I decided to go into electrical engineering. Okay, by all means, the electrical engineering degree that I received had accomplished three of the three points of the triangle. It gave me a network experience and the potential for making a lot of money in the electrical engineering field, right? But here's the thing. I'm not great at electrical engineering. I can do it, but it's not something that comes naturally to me. On the left is a simple circuit that I made, and on the right is the output. And you don't have to be an electrical engineer to know that something looks wrong with the output when it's actually supposed to look like this, okay? There's a very distinct difference. But the question remains, again, why was my cello something so successful when it only hit two to three points of the triangle, when my electrical engineering degree, which hit three to three points of the triangle, wasn't as impactful in my career? Well, the answer is this. It's passion. Because the guiding triangle, right, is not actually a triangle, but rather it's a pyramid with passion making that fourth point of the pyramid. Passion supersedes network experience and money. Because without passion, you cannot excel. Passion drives success. This triangle is very helpful for focusing intentions and guiding people. But whenever I share this philosophy with other young people like myself, people that are in high school, uni, or just about to graduate uni, they say, you know what, Maddie, this is great. The triangle's cool. But the triangle only seems to work if you know what your passion is. And I don't know what my passion is. To those people, I tell you that some passion is something that you love. I love cats. It's something you find interesting, like 3D printing or something that gets you excited, like a really good pizza at late night. Okay. And as we look at this vision board of things that we love that are interesting and exciting, we might not find a discernible pattern of quote unquote passion. We might see something like pizza and we might be like, you know what? I could have a degree in the pizza industry, or excuse me, a professional career in the pizza industry for maybe two years because I have passion for it now, but I don't know if I have passion, enough passion to pursue a career in pizza for the rest of my life, okay? And to those people, I tell you, that's okay. Pursue something that you're passionate about right now and run with it for as far and as long as you can for as long as you enjoy it. Because the fact is, you might not do that one job or stay in that one career forever. Your passions will change as you grow and develop and come into yourself, and that's A-OK. -okay. That happens to us all, all right? So remember, because the experiences that you gain as you pursue this passion that you momentarily have for a couple of years is what will eventually prepare you for the next passion that you will chase and oftentimes also introduce you to that next passion 
that you will chase. I get it. This is all easier said than done. You know, you look at this, I can come off as all inspirational and cool, but again, the future is full of paths. There's an infinite amount of paths that you can take going forward. And it is scary. It is paralyzing to the point where you won't even choose something because you're too afraid to go forward with some, to dedicate yourself to a passion that you don't think you'll have in 10 years. But really, the one thing I can tell you to do is choose that path and move forward. Just do it. Because the only thing that kills any passion, momentarily or not, is doing nothing, is being stagnant, okay? Remember the pyramid. The pyramid works. The pyramid has worked for me, it's worked for my friends, and it has worked for many erodies that are trying to get in with the next big act. Remember passion. Remember to keep passion in everything you do. Remember that passion is what supersedes building network, getting experience, or getting money, because without passion, you cannot reasonably excel at any of those. So, for the moment, pick a path, something you're passionate about, and run with it, because you'll be so surprised where that path will take you. You would have asked me six years ago, and told me that I would be presenting at a digital conference during a global pandemic about 3D printing. I would say, global pandemic? Like, no, that will never happen. And two, what is 3D printing? I could have never pictured where my career would went, but because I pursued a passion at the time for electrical engineering, I found my path of where I meant to be of 3D printing, or excuse me, electrical engineering. I found my path of where I meant to be with 3D printing. So I have faith that if you use this guiding pyramid, this geometry as a focus for your intentions, you will eventually find out where you're supposed to be and be able to and turn those temporary passions into a forever passion. So thank you so much for your time. And I know I'm a little bit early, it looks like about five minutes, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Otherwise, I'm just gonna keep talking to you. So. Let's see, let me go back to my screen, open this up. Do I sell 3D printed cellos? Thank you, Elena. Not joking, I know a couple of people who might be interested. Well, Alana, thank you so much for actually asking the question. I actually don't sell 3D printed cellos. That was a custom build of my own. I scanned my entire cello using a Faro scanning arm, did all the post-processing and then printed it on a Fortis. It took me about three months to do with my entire life dedicated to that cello, about 16 hours a day. Um, so no, this cello is not for sale. However, there are options on Thingiverse if you want to do a 3D printed electric cello where you can actually print the body for an electric cello. I also have the files. So if you do want the 3D printed cello files and attempt to print it yourself, I can tell you how to do it. Don't think I would recommend it, but if you want to, it's there for you. Okay. How did the triangle concept, oh, I saw one right there. There we go. How did the triangle concept help me found, found my own company? Thank you so much for asking that question. So for those of you that don't know, I started my own little LLC to do some freelancing on the side. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, where my first position after graduating college, I graduated in December 2020, will be. And so this freelancing gig is just something to hold me over. But to figure out how how the triangle helped me, I decided, you know what, I have a passion for 3D printing, so that's care of the point of the pyramid. And for the three bottom points of the triangle, was again, I need some money just to hold me over, because again, I'm a, I'm a student, I got loans to pay back, right? And then it was also, can I gain new experience? So I branched into marketing for my consulting role, so doing uh, content for people for the added manufacturing space, which helped me learn to do skill as well. So that was how the triangle helped me found my own company and the philosophy of which I applied it to. Okay. What does the future look like for you? Where do you plan on taking your career? Another really good question. So future looks like for me, well, eventually I want to have my own real full company, not necessarily a consultancy firm. And where do I plan on taking my career? Well, I plan on sticking around in additive or at least advanced manufacturing so far in the industry 4.0. And for me, the future is whatever I'm excited about now. I'll go find an opportunity that I love, 
and work on it for as long as I can. And when no longer, if it suits me, I'll move on to something else. Although I will say that I really, really like to straddle that line between the technical roles and the customers who might not necessarily understand everything, all the technical stuff that's going on in the background within the additive manufacturing. So that's a little hint for you on that one. Hey, Chanel, what other projects have you completed that helped you drive your passion for 3D printing? That's a really good question, Kate. So I think some of my other projects that I worked on that helped me drive my passion are things that are helpful for people. So one of my passion projects I've been working with with additive manufacturing and also laser scanning is being a teaching assistant for our School of Architecture who has a whole entire fab lab. So I teach students not only how to operate ferro scanning arms, but I teach them how to utilize 3D printing and the best practices of that. So those are the other pro projects that really keep me going, and they're not necessarily a tangible project, but something fun. How was I exposed to AM while obtaining my EE degree? Was it by using 3D labs in your school? So no, my school actually, when I was a freshman, did not have any 3D printing whatsoever, save for one dimension. Well, it was a dimension, so those are like F123s now. And I was introduced to 3D printing during a guest lecture by one of my professors named Dan Beller. And it was an introductory to like electrical engineering course, but they just had a guest lecture in for some reason. And that's where I was introduced to EBE first. And thank you, Janet, for telling me I'm over time. I thought I had to 35. Okay, great. So thank you guys so much. I do. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I really do appreciate being able to present to you. And Sarah, I'm going to give you your privileges to turn on your camera and mic and welcome you to the stage. So feel free to turn it on right now. Sarah will be giving a presentation called, um, let's see here, Medical 3D Printing, a Technologist Approach to Implementing a Point of Care Program. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks everybody for coming here. Let me just share my screen and I can start. We're all good? Awesome. So um, welcome again. Thank you guys. Uh, I think I think the coolest thing so far of this, this whole um, two day conference was figuring out everyone's way into additive. And I think Sarah said it earlier best. Um, at the opening keynote where she said, this technology found us. So um, it's definitely neat, but I'm gonna talk about my story and a little bit of like how I got into this. So so who am I? Um, my name is Sarah Rimini. I'm program director at our 3D lab here at Geisinger Health System. Um, th our 3D lab encompasses 3D imaging and printing. And my educational background is gonna be different from most of you. So I have an associate's degree in radiography. I got that right out of school. And then um, I just received my bachelor's back in 2019 in medical imaging. And I am currently enrolled in the Master of Engineering and Additive Manufacturing and Design through Penn State right now. So our health system is a rather large health system in rural Pennsylvania. Um, we have a lot of hospitals, but they're spread out all over the state. Uh, we also have a medical school and we have a health insurance plan that actually um, helps explain how we got started. So a little bit more of a background. Um, we have a 3D imaging lab here. We started in 2012. And whenever you get a CAT scan or an MRI, built into your charges for that are these 3D reconstructions. It helps the clinicians see things better and it helps the radiologist make dictations better and faster for you all, instead of uh, just constantly looking at that sliced black and white data, it's kind of hard to see. So all through the country, CAT scan or MRI techs um, post-process these images on screen and send them to PACS just along with your other images. Um, back in 2012, we decided to start a 3D imaging lab where we have a dedicated staff that doesn't do CAT scan or MRI anymore, but we sit in a lab and we do medical segmentation and design for on-screen processing. We have about 10 technologists right now and we're doing about 3,000 studies. This is pre-COVID, obviously we're down a little bit, but um, yeah, so they do all the MSK, any kind of uh, that one on the end is your aorta, your face, your ribs, all of that stuff. So we're really well versed in anatomy, pathology, and medical segmentation. So how did we get into 3D printing? Um, 
kind of fell into our laps. So we had a cardiologist that has a printer in his basement and he knew that we're really good at doing any kind of medical segmentation and the software we use has STL export. So he came to us and said, if you can um, design this heart for me and send me the files, I'm gonna try and print it. And I want to try and practice on this patient's heart. She has a really weird heart, um, practice on it before I get in there. We kind of all thought he was crazy because uh, going from this on-screen image to a physical model is something we would never heard of before. We're not, um, we're not engineering background. We, we don't have anything like that. I don't want to date myself, but I didn't have printers in high school or college either. We, we didn't uh, mess around with that stuff then, but we gave him the file and this is what uh, he came up with. And we were kind of blown away by it. So we lobbied our radiology department to purchase just a, a cheaper desktop model and see what we could do, see if we could make some of this too. But as I said, we have absolutely no background in 3D printing. So I'll show you our first, my first prints here, <laughs> Geisinger. Um, you can see the Ultimaker robot is eventually the, the end game here, but this is where I started off. So I love showing this picture. People that have seen me present are probably sick and tired of seeing this picture, but it just kind of grounds me and reminds me where I came from, that first like little glob of plastic um, to what we're doing now. So it's, it's pretty impressive. This is our timeline of where we are now. Um, so I talked about our health insurance plan. They give out quality fund grants every year and that helps improve the quality of our patients throughout our system. So with their funding, we were able to create an entire lab. So we have seven printers now. Um, we got to purchase dedicated medical segmentation and design software. We purchased some scanners and some VR headsets anything that can help our patients um, we're trying to work towards. And the pictures on the bottom are kind of cool because it's it's kind of a neat progression of our quality and the materials we have uh, as time goes by too. So normally if a clinician requests a model, it kind of falls into one or more of these buckets. And these are the reasons why we do these here in our hospital. So pre-surgical planning, we will make models for surgeons that let's say in this picture, um, there's a nasty tumor. It's the bright green thing there. It's wrapped around the heart. These are some of the other structures, the arteries, the veins, the airway, um, and then also the spine is right there too. They are not used to looking at that black and white data and trying to figure out from the outside of that patient how we're going to get this tumor without touching any of that other stuff. So we give them the model. It's full scale. It's true to size. We we double check that the contours are correct and, and everything looks um, the same as what it would be whenever they open this patient up and they get to hold it and they get to plan off of that. Um, it gives them this other element and uh, other tool that they never had before. Surgical simulation is kind of the same, but it goes a little further into that. So not only are they looking at it to plan, but they're actually practicing on that model. So they can put a catheter up through it. Um, they can put, they can size out different valves, things like that. And this is all saving them time in the OR then and decreasing complication rates as well. We're big into education as well here. So staff and resident education, um, things might not come around all the time. A special case might come once every 10 years. Uh, the cool thing about 3D printing then is we can print the model, but not only that, we can save the files too. So we can always have that model to reprint or to give out to different facilities to teach them, this is this anomaly, this is how they dealt with it, but this is what it looked like. You're never gonna see this maybe in your next 10 years of your career, but this is something that you can educate yourself on. We also do a lot of uh, 3D printing for molds um, that we'll get into as well. But, and then the big thing that I never realized, I don't think as a medical professional, we do very much, but um, there's, a, there's a whole nother side to this. this. There's the patient that has no idea, um, mainly, from a CAT scan or an MRI, what things look like. It kind of all just looks the same. And maybe for you guys too, if I should, showed you something on a CAT scan or an MRI, you might not understand it as much. Um, we're starting to do a lot of models for informed consent where the surgeon can sit down with that patient, show them the model, show them what they're gonna do. And then they're all on the same page together and that patient's fully trusting that surgeon. And then we're working on some surgical aid tools. so some biocompatible materials that can touch bone for up to 24 hours, um, and they can plan a surgery off of that so that the tumor that's in this patient here, they're not gonna cut into it accidentally because 
once you cut into a tumor um, in the operating room, it spills out cancer cells and that can add to a reoccurrence. So if we can plan the cuts online with them before this, design um, a guide that fits on that patient only one way, and those are the cuts that prevent them from getting uh, touching that tumor at all and it all comes out in one piece, then it's worth it. So here are some cool models I just wanted to show too. This is one of my more recent ones. Um, these are some of our radiography students. So I, I used to be in this position years and years ago, but skull work is really hard. There's, they're few and far between, and it's just really difficult to figure out all the different angles of the tube and angles of the patient. And um, people, the technologists usually have to do multiple repeats on this patient because they can't seem to get it right the first time. So I started figuring, uh, thinking about that and designed a model that is anatomically correct inside as it is externally for the landmarks like the nose and the ears that you have to learn the angles to for x-ray. So, and the cool thing is this has nothing to do with any patients and they can shoot x-rays at it all day long. Um, it's not gonna hurt anything. So the students just started um, working on skull work with this and we're gonna, we're gonna keep developing different phantoms for them and stuff because they're, they're really enjoying it. Another cool um, aspect that we got into, I said we purchased some surface scanners. Um, it's gonna be called Caring Beyond Medicine and it's for pediatric bereavement purposes right now. Um, so if a child is passing away, we can scan their hand for the family and that's something they can have. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a great thing to talk about a lot, but it does happen and it's something that we can provide to that family to help them cope through this. We're gonna do it. So we're just in the planning phases of this. This is child life on the right here. They're an amazing team and they'll be the ones that are going in the room and scanning, scanning the patient and, um, we're just trying to figure out the best uh, common practices and ways to go about this so far, but it's kind of an exciting project. And then how do you get, how do you spend all this money in a hospital and not make any money? You have to keep justifying yourself. So all the time um, we send out these print feedback forms to the surgeons, something super easy, they can check off quick, write a couple lines um, and just give us the feedback we need. So in this case, uh, this prevented positive tumor margins. Like I said before, there's nothing that spilled out. So that model that cost maybe a couple hundred dollars was priceless. So we continue to collect this. We continue to collect um, some feedback on our, our program and continue to update our administration on how, how impactful this is and how much we're saving in the end. So enough about our lab and everything like that. How did I get into this? Um, I'm a big fan of future proofing and I'm sure you guys all know about this, but it's kind of like riding the waves. Uh, you're gonna prepare yourself and your skill sets for an ever-changing workforce. 3D printing is no different. Things are evolving. I mean, we started 3D printing in 2015. That's nothing like it is back then even. So you have to be able to um, grow and evolve into something to continue on with this or to continue in the future. You have to look into certain things. So my career moves. Um, like I said, I started out doing x-ray. I, I did x-ray at a hospital for 10 months, and then Geisinger hired me on as an MRI tech. They cross-trained me. I took my boards for that, so I'm certified actually still to go do x-rays and MRIs. Then we started the 3D imaging, the on-screen, like I said before, and then into 3D printing, and then I knew being the director of this with just a medical background wasn't going to be enough, so I am like uh, currently involved in an engineering program and I go around pre-COVID, now it's virtually, but talk to everybody about my journey and how I got here and inspire some. So what's the future of 3D printing look like? How are you gonna ride these waves if you don't know what's happening? So there are tons of patient specific metal implants right now that are coming out. These are things that have been around for a while but it's all medical device manufacturers that are providing these for the hospitals. And that's great. They're doing an amazing job. We're not trying to take away from that, but there are possibilities of some hospitals like hospitals for specialty services in Lima are partnering. Um, this is crazy that it's already been since June, 2019. I think 2020 just kind of went all over our heads here, but um, they're partnering together for an entire um, kind of, open and close case where they're gonna be in the hospital providing these patient specific metal implants 
as a device manufacturing company. So this is huge for all of us. We're kind of cutting out the middleman. We're making sure the device company is still, still going to be getting what they need. They're still going to be providing the models to us, but they're going to be physically in the hospital where that patient is getting care. So consultations, um, shipping, anything like that is going to be completely improved upon. And this, this is a, a big thing coming out. Another big thing you guys all know about is bioprinting um, cells and uh, cells in gel and then hopefully implanting this into a body to produce more cells or grow organs eventually. How far away are we from maybe paintable skin in, in the combat field or growing a heart? I know we're pretty far away from this, but it, it's, it's coming up. It's going to be possible. This is something that's new and um, it's, it's just something interesting that you might have to keep an eye on. And how do you how do you keep an eye on these things if you're not in this field? So there's three big medical uh, work groups that are, you know, developing the standards and everything right now. So ASME, SME, and RSNA is the Radiologic Society of North America. So they're all the um, radi radiology, imaging, and things like that. But we have our own 3D printing special interest group. So together with these three groups, we're developing the standards for these point of care um, 3D print labs like myself and just trying to prove their values and, and get everything where it needs to be. So keep an eye on those things if you're interested. And then just some key takeaways, like anything is possible. If I could do this, you guys can do this. Um, stay alert to your field or anything that interests you to see how you can get involved in that in the future, grow yourself up to it. Be open to changing your roles and responsibilities. If you're static, it's not gonna happen. You have to ride those waves of growth and do what you love. Have fun and try and find your reason for being. So like Maddie said about, about the pyramid, this is kind of the same thing. If you find what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid for and what you're good at, all of those together, that's actually your purpose. And uh, a lot of us have found this and we're really lucky about it. But you guys that are just getting into this field right now, start looking around for those things. Start start researching and getting involved where you can and and just start riding those waves. So with that, I just wanted to thank Type and Women in 3D Printing and Maddie for doing all of this. And uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or anything like that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a really, really exciting presentation. And I had no idea that you actually scanned hands for child bereavement. That is really cool and something I find very touching. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Of course. Go ahead and turn off your camera and mic. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome to the stage our next speaker, Joelle Grakowski. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Joelle. And she will be speaking on her presentation, Standing Out, Skills to Consider Other Than 3D Printing. Joelle is also working at Stanley Black & Decker. Thank you so much. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk with you all today um, and just share my experiences. So my name is Joelle Grakowski. I am leading additive manufacturing business development for Stanley Black & Decker. And for those of you that don't know, Stanley Black & Decker is a pretty big organization. They're about $14 billion corporation. And they're most known for being number one in tools and storage. So you probably recognize Stanley as a brand and Black & Decker as a brand. Well, in 2010, they merged and formed Stanley Black & Decker. And under their portfolio um, are many recognizable brands like DeWalt, Craftsman, Bostitch, Proto, Facom, Lennox, the list goes on and on. Um, and aside from a tools and storage company. We're also uh, number two in commercial electronic security services. And we're also a global leader in fastening. So altogether, I think we have about 140 manufacturing facilities globally. Um, and it's my role to identify um, opportunities to utilize additive manufacturing. Where can we bring in new technology? What's the right fit? Um, so we do a lot. And during this talk, I'll be going through how I got to where I am today, um, you know, advice I would give my younger self, and then most importantly, um, I'll be speaking to my view on how to go about getting the job that you want. So without further ado, my journey started when I was in college. I was studying 
industrial and systems engineering. And I, like a lot of other students, didn't really know what I wanted to do with my career. And so I decided to take an internship. And so I got an internship at a manufacturing facility nearby to my college. And it was a good opportunity to just learn about manufacturing operations, how a facility runs, you know, what the processes are in place to make sure you have good quality, um, what kind of troubleshooting you can do if there's a problem on the floor, uh, looking at, you know, if you have a prototype or a new product, how do you go about um, figuring out what the manufacturing method will be. And I guess I was doing something right because I wound up getting hired um, full time as a manufacturing engineer. And um, I was a manufacturing engineer for about two years. And so um, the facility that I was in was utilizing additive, but I wasn't too involved until I met the leader of additive manufacturing for the company. And so then we started working on a small side project of looking at post processing of additive products and additive parts. And this was kind of my introduction to additive as a whole. I've never really seen much. I knew of it, but um, never really had any hands-on experience. So we started um, looking at post-processing and I was intrigued because, um, you know, it was such a new opportunity to explore and there were so many different things that we could try out. And so this leader was, um, creating a team, a small team to do some R&D for the company. And so one thing led to another and I was asked to be an additive manufacturing engineer. Now, mind you, I didn't have any additive experience, um, but I guess I was a good fit for the team that this leader was making. And I just want to take this moment to say that take every opportunity that comes your way, no matter how big or small, um, you know, opportunities that really push you outside of your comfort zone, that's when you're really going to grow as a person and professionally. And I can honestly say I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you all today um, if I hadn't taken that opportunity. And that opportunity really changed my, my career path and my life. Um, so obviously, I took the, um, the job. And um, I remember vividly on my first day, uh, I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. And we went to um, shadow and additive OEMs uh, meeting. So there was about like 20 to 30 different AM experts in this meeting. And they were going on about, you know, their technology, what hurdles they were having, what kind of experiments they were doing. And I just remember sitting there thinking, why am I here? All this information is flying over my head and feeling really lost. And I learned two major things during my time as an additive manufacturing engineer. One of them being, don't doubt yourself or your experiences or your knowledge. Ultimately, what I realized was we had a very small team and we all brought unique aspects to the team and we all impacted and collaborated um, based upon our previous experiences. So for example, um, no one else on the team ever worked in a manufacturing facility and so, I was able to showcase, you know, what would this technology look like in a bigger, larger, pre-existing manufacturing area. Or one thing I didn't mention is that I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt. So I really uh, like looking at data and statistics and crunching the numbers. So I made sure that we were always on track with keeping accurate um, data and showcasing progress through, um, statistics and making sure we were on track that way. So I would just say, you know, even though I didn't have any additive experience, I still impacted the team greatly. And then the second thing I learned through this role was the power of continuous education. You know, some may think that, you know, your education kind of stops when you graduate or you're out of school. And I found with this role specifically, that there's so much information out there to be consumed that you just have to put your head down and learn as much as you possibly can. And that's really how you can get further ahead is by um, self-educating and continuously learning. And so when I was sitting in that meeting feeling like I didn't know what anyone was talking about, it really pushed me to, you know, outside of work, learn about additive. So I would go 
um, home and you know watch YouTube videos of different additive technology. I started going to women in 3D printing events to network with you know professionals in the industry and learn what other people were doing. I took an additive manufacturing course and I did. Um, I started attending conferences, and so with all of this, I just learned that you know by utilizing the resources you have around you, you can really grow yourself professionally and individually. And this is something I've taken to this day. Um, I continuously read every day on different topics that, or skills that I want to try and possess and then practice that in my day-to-day -day life. And so I became, or I was an additive manufacturing engineer for about a year. And then I transitioned to Stanley Black & Decker as a program manager. And now I'm transitioning to another role as um, additive manufacturing business development. So now I'm gonna transition to talking about, you know, getting the role you want. I've experienced many different roles and, um, you know, unique opportunities. And we could talk about stick, standing out in a pool of 100 applicants um, or, you know, the power of networking and being able to write a persuasive cover letter. But I kind of want to go a different route. And so my advice to everyone would be, you know, start doing whatever the job is that you want today. And I know that sounds pretty crazy, um, but I'll give you a few examples. So if you want to be in marketing and you want to do marketing for an additive OEM, start doing that today. Start creating marketing content and, um, you know, marketing campaign strategy and put that into a cover letter or resume um, and showcase that you're able to do this job. It's not about the experience, but it's about how you utilize your time and, you know, show your passion through what you're doing. And this doesn't just apply to new hires. It also applies to, you know, wanting a better role or responsibility, um, wanting a promotion. I had a colleague who was brilliant. She was such, uh, she really understood 3D printing and um, she wanted to be able to take the creative thoughts and visions of products and be able to print them. But she was missing the link of being able to CAD model. So one day she came into our um, facility and aside from her day-to-day -day work, she started learning how to do CAD on her own. She watched tutorials. She started working with the CAD experts in the company. Um, and so when the time came that they were looking for a leader for designing for additive manufacturing, it was obvious that this person was, you know, well equipped for the role, meaning that, you know, she took it in, oh, she took it into her own hands to start doing the job that she wanted today and acquiring those skills to showcase and basically building that resume to say, look, I've been doing this, this and this. I'm ready for the role. And so I really believe if you take every opportunity that scares you, if you continuously learn and you start doing the job that you want today, that you will really be unstoppable and ultimately really successful. So thank you all for your time today. Um, I think I'm right on time. So if there's any questions, Maddie, maybe we can take those. For sure, yeah, let's see. I don't see any questions for you right now, Joelle, but if there's any that pop up into the q and I'll be sure to forward them over to you. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it, Joelle. It was a very inspiring speech, and I really like the comment that you made about start doing the job that you want now. I think that's so helpful and really good for everyone that's trying to better themselves. Of course. Yeah, definitely. So up next, we have another speaker who will be presenting her presentation, How, Why Are Fresh Faces Beneficial to Additive Manufacturing Teams? This is Jillian Gorsh. She's a Metal AM Strategies and, and she's with Metal AM Strategies and Applications at Hummingbird Additive. So Jillian, I'm giving you permission right now to share your camera, so go ahead and turn it on. Thank you, Maddie, I appreciate it. Right. Hi, Jillian. And I'm going to stay on stage for as long as it takes for you to get your slides on, just so we know that everything's working well. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So go ahead and share your screen. Okay, and I'll 
try to make it full screen for you in one second. All right. And if you want to go ahead and click percent and just move forward once or twice so I know that you can all see it. There you go. It should be good. It's working on your end, Maddie? Yep, it is working. All right. I'll let you get going. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you all for tuning in. Today, I'm going to be talking about why fresh faces are beneficial to AM teams. Before we get started, I'll give you a brief background of myself. I'm co-founder of Hummingbird Additive. We're a metal additive manufacturing consulting company. My educational background is in mechanical engineering and space systems engineering. So today we're going to talk about why fresh faces are beneficial to AM teams. And the reason are five benefits. You provide a fresh perspective, curiosity and collaboration, digital tool know-how, hands-on AM experience, and an additive mindset. So before we get into the details of what each of those means, it's first important to understand that there are many ways you can contribute to an AM team. So here we have an example of eight different roles and some example skill sets that go along with them. So when you're looking for your first job in AM, it's important to take the time and understand what each role is and then try to find the right match for your interests and your skill sets and look for the right fit for you. So the first benefit we're gonna talk about today is that fresh faces bring a fresh perspective. A new person on a team will provide objective evaluations. They'll understand the latest methods and techniques from other project teams, and they'll bring in energy and enthusiasm along with their point of view. So when you have a team approach a challenging project from multiple perspectives, you actually result in a more comprehensive solution. So an example from my experience actually happened on the very first day of my first internship. I was being introduced to my department and I met a gentleman who shook my hand and immediately handed me a USB. He told me on this USB there was 5,000 lines of data in all different formats and I was going to need to consolidate, format, and sort it. Not just once, but probably at least three times throughout my internship. So I took the USB back to my desk and I thought, how can I do this more efficiently? What can I do to bring added value? And I ended up making an Excel macro that was able to automate all of the different steps involved to consolidate and format the data. So at the end of the week, I was able to turn in the data and the format that he needed for his project, but I also turned in a tool. So every other time he needed to update the data in his project or in his program, he was able to do it with me in about an hour, whereas before it always took a couple of days. So that's reoccurring savings, thanks to approaching a problem with a fresh perspective. The second benefit is curiosity and collaboration. So with curiosity, you ask lots of questions. Can this be done better? When is this good enough? And you really dig deep to understand. And you're putting the time and effort in to really iterate until it's right. With collaboration, you listen to understand and you want to take that extra time to learn from your team members' experiences. And when you participate in brainstorming, you're not only contributing your own ideas to the team, but you're really trying to understand others' perspectives and their rationale. So that's a really important part of the learning process. So curiosity and collaboration are the keys to becoming an effective team member and effective teams find effective solutions. The third benefit is digital tool know-how. Being able to use the latest digital tools brings value to your team, whether you're able to provide assistance with generative design, analysis, or inspection. Bringing what you need can help the team. One example from my background actually came during an internal rotation program where they were moving employees from one department to another so that we could train and learn and teach new skills. So I ended up moving to a department that built a tooling for an entire satellite. And the satellite's about the size of the school bus. So you can imagine how large these CAD models were, even in the simplified rep forms. So we had some really heavy drawings. And over the course of my time with the department, I was able to make over 100 Creo map keys to really streamline the drawing creation process and save a lot of time. 
And it's not, I'm happy to say that seven years later, uh, they're still being used. So that's, uh, so by bringing my digital tool know-how from another department and bringing it to help my new team, I was able to provide lasting value for that team. So you might have noticed that the first three benefits I discussed don't actually require AM expertise to help an AM team, but the last two do. So how does a hands-on AM experience and an additive mindset help? Well, let's consider an example of support material. So you'll see the letter A as a mixture of both white and yellow material. So the white material is our intended print material. But with additive, each layer is supported by the previous layer. So in order to actually be able to print it in the orientation shown, you need to add some yellow support material to actually support the geometry, not only at the base of the A, but also at the circular portion. But if you have AM experience, then you'll notice that if you actually just rotate the A upside down and change the circle to a teardrop shape, you don't need support material anymore. And that one simple change will require less material and give you a faster print. And support material is just one example of uh, a large cost driver for products because you're really paying for it three times. You're paying for the cost of the material, you're paying for the longer machine runtime, and you're paying for the labor to remove the supports. Many of you may have experience removing plastic support material, and though it's a bit tedious and can be annoying, but let me tell you that when you switch to metal additive manufacturing, that increases tenfold. So anytime you're working on a design and you're able to minimize support material, you will make everyone much happier. So when you bring your AM experience, whether it's gained through hobbies or what you learned in college, you actually bring the understanding of machines and processes, which is really valuable. Why is it valuable? Because you can recognize what designs make sense for AM. You also have learned how to operate and to maintain a machine. And you've learned from both your successes and failures. Now, since it's more entertaining to hear about failures, I'll tell you about a print failure that I experienced. I so working on a prototype and I started a print and kept an eye on it in the beginning. Everything looked good, so I went home for the night. The next morning I arrived and went to check on the print and there was just blue plastic everywhere. We actually ended up nicknaming it the blue smurf incident. And uh, the worst part of it was that the machine even said, congratulations, your part has successfully printed. And no, we didn't. So it took us a little time to figure out what exactly happened to have blue plastic go everywhere. And what we realized was on the first floor of our building, someone was probably moving some pretty heavy tooling. And that might have just gently shook the second floor of the building enough for the door of the machine to pop open. And when that happened, we then had the extruding plastic hitting the door and making this cascading beautiful waterfall uh, creation instead of printing the part that we anticipated. So luckily, there was a very simple fix, just to tape the door shut. And by taping the door shut, we never had a similar problem again. But it's failures like these and also lessons learned from successes that really build your AM experience and your understanding. And it allows you to take all of these lessons learned into your next project and to your next project team. So whether successes or from successes or failures, your AM experience is valuable. So let's say now you have the hands-on AM experience. But can you see the big picture? If you have an additive mindset, you can see the big picture and you can communicate trade-offs. Thinking additively means you understand business drivers. You can communicate realistic AM capabilities and you know which AM processes make the most sense for the application. You can also evaluate post-processing trade-offs. If you have an understanding of the full AM workflow, then you are an asset to any team from day one. One example of where this came up in my background was when I was working on an R&D project. 
We had received a prototype and sent it for functional testing, and unfortunately, it failed all of the tests. And we were at a meeting trying to decide, well, do we scrap the program or what can we do? So I took some time and thought about it and realized that the geometry that we were trying to make could actually be printed using a different process and a different material. So instead of scrapping the project, we decided to give that a try. We sent that off to be made, and when we received the new prototype, we sent that for testing, and it passed all of its functional tests with flying colors. In addition to actually meeting our performance requirements, we were about at half the cost. And so with taking the time to evaluate different processes, we were able to actually provide significant cost savings to the project. So today we've briefly discussed five benefits that fresh faces will bring to a team. So we know that you will benefit the team, but it's really important to understand that the team also benefits you. When you're working together and you're learning together, a team with young and experienced contributors drives innovation. So when you're looking for your next job in AM, you can say, hire me. I bring a fresh perspective, curiosity and collaboration, digital tool know-how, hands-on AM experience, and an additive mindset. And for any hiring managers that are in the audience, when you're looking for the next person to add to your AM team, please keep in mind that a team with both young and experienced members truly drives innovation. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, Jillian, for that lovely presentation. It was so helpful to be able to hear your experiences as an intern, especially when you were working with that at One second. All right, but yeah, thank you so much. I, do you wanna say goodbye to the audience or? Yeah, sorry, my internet broke up there. Oh, yeah, no second, worries, but... no worries. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for listening. Uh, just the advice is to know that you can really look into all the different AM roles that are available and understand what the skills are required for each company. Uh, there are many ways you can support an AM team and join the AM community. So take the time to research those specifics and then find the best fit for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We do appreciate all of your time that you took, took to share with us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day at the Type Conference, Jillian. Thank you.